Welcome. Good to see you again. Brandon, good to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you all. Yeah, thanks for coming, good audience. Um, so we have, I'm going to start with the kind of basic bio. Uh, as Brett had just mentioned, uh, Leah's new collection of poems, It Shouldn't Have Been Beautiful, uh, is uh, came out in October mm -hmm. 25, yeah, 2015, so uh, with Peg Penguin Viking. Um, she's the author of three previous collections of poems, King Baby, Stone Sky Lifting, the, Bright, uh, the Brighter the Veil, three collections of essays, Rough Likeness, On Looking and Increase, and one collection of translations, uh, poems of... Grzegorz Muschau. <laughs> <laughs> it is Polish. So. Yeah. Thank you for stepping in there, yeah. Um, and a finalist for the National Book Critic Circle Award for On Looking, she has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, a Fulbright Foundation Fellowship, uh, Translation Warsaw, Poland, three Pushcart Prizes, a grant from the Maryland State Arts Council, multiple residencies and fellowships at the McDowell Colony. Uh, Leah's poems and essays appear in Agni Magazine, Ecotone Field, The Georgia Review, Orion, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, uh, Poetry and Review, Plowshares, The Southern Review, and many other magazines and anthologies. Uh, she is including Best American Essays 2011 and the Pushcart Anthology. Uh, she is a writer in residence at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and she teaches at the Rainier Writing Workshop in Tacoma. Recently, she has served as the Bettel Visiting Writer at the University of Iowa's MFA program in nonfiction, Cole Royalty Visiting Professor at the University of Alabama's MFA program, Visiting Writer at the Warren and Patricia Benson Forum on Creativity at Eastman Conservatory in Rochester, New York, and has taught at the MFA programs at Columbia, Bennington, and at the Breadloaf Writers Conference. She is, in other words, a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very, very pleased to have her here. Um, so this semester, Leah, I'm teaching History of the Essay class, a graduate course. So we're looking at the sweep of time from antiquity to the contemporary period. And there's a lot of things that reoccur, resurge, uh, and, and go away and come back in that sort of warp of time. And one of the things that I've been noticing, we've talked a little bit about in the class, and I wanted to maybe start with this, is that every decade or so, somebody comes out and says, the essay is dead. <laughs> And, uh, I, I mean, we have this as early as 1849, um, and then somebody will say, no, 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 the essay is quite fine, and 1922, Virginia Woolf said, dear reader, the essay is alive, do not despair. Eleven years later, John P. Waters in um, the Forum, 1933, had a piece called A Little Old Lady Passes Away. Do you, are you familiar with this? No. It's quite good, it's, it, and I'll just read a little bit here. The familiar essay, that lavender-scented little old lady of literature, has passed away. Search the magazines for the sparrow, sparrowy whimsies, and in all but one or two of them, you will find in her stead crisp articles, blatant exposés, or st uh, statistic-laden surveys. Even in the few that admit her pale ghost into their circle of economists, sociologists, and Washington correspondents, her position is decidedly subordinate, a scant column or two near the insurance advertisements at the back of the book. Her mourners, and there still are many, wonder why. Um, what do you, what's your sense of the state? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, so... In 2016, what's the state of the essay in your estimation? Are we in a good place, or mm -hmm. is it mm -hmm. waning? Is it on the rise? It's really good to hear um, you phrase it, the essay, you know, to call it the essay. I, mm -hmm. I, it's really my preferred term for creative nonfiction. Um, the non part is, of course, a definition away from as opposed to a thing you right. know, unto itself. What do you write? Well, I don't write this. Right. I write non <laughs> So, So, you know, the essay to me is this wildly capacious form that can hold book length pieces, um, book length collections of smaller pieces, right. fragmented pieces. Um, Things that look like, or you'd swear, were poems, sure. given all the space between you know prose lines. Um, so I, I I think, you know, the essay has 
always been with us. And there, you know, are folks who, you know, make careers of pronouncing deaths and rebirths. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting, I guess. There was the whole, which you may have followed, you know, poetry is dead of the early 90s, you know, that argument. And, um, you know, I'm never aware of these passings. I feel like I live on some island, um, you know, where I'm happily doing my work and suddenly someone says, it, you know, your work is dead. Yeah, the and, novel and is dead, <laughs> poetry is dead. You know, I, yeah. I press my own heart and think, no, I'm alive, I really am. I'm pretty much here, yeah, I'm Pretty much here, here. yeah. So I, th I think, you know, the state of the essay as it's being in interpreted and practiced is, is pretty vast and capacious mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, the new-ish thing is, you know, having, uh, you know, MFA programs in, in the essay or in nonfiction or CNF, mm -hmm. um, so we don't have to say that non-word. Um, so when I was doing my MFA, there were not um, all that many, if, if any really, that I'm remembering um, programs in, in, in the essay. So. And you, you went to Iowa in poetry, new. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm and untrained as an essayist, <laughs> and here I am. And yet here you are. <laughs> and yet here I am before you. Um, so you started, a, so you, you did your MFA at Iowa Writers Workshop in Poetry. What led you into the essay? Mm. What led to the essay should be pretty encouraging, I think, for any of you. Um, and it was a stoppage of poems actually. Uh, so I hit, I hit a kind of wall and couldn't write poems at a certain point. Um, I, was, I was actually pregnant with my, uh, our son and um, they were just not coming, not mm. working. Poems, suddenly things sounded maudlin and I thought, oh my god, I've lost it. This is what happens to a pregnant person. <laughs> and, um, and my husband suggested something and I remember scoffing, it was terrible. This all began in scoffing, and he said, why don't you just like, go write some lines, write sentences. And I said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> I can't write poems. <laughs> and did, I remember going upstairs and doing just that, and you know, writing line after line, and sentence after sentence, and feeling this, um, I can only describe it really as a musculature taking over. And uh, I did it you know, day after day, and collected these sentences in a folder, and um, the pages, you know, formed and became projects and or essays, and I held off calling them anything. I didn't even know what to call them. Mm -hmm. You know, what is a poet who writes not non poems? Mm -hmm. um, and they, they, I became, you know, interested enough and confident enough, and they um, formed. And I secretly called them essays, and mm -hmm. they secretly <laughs> became a book. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I was really hooked, and so was able to. Um, Use both both musculatures um, equally, yeah. and um, and still do today. So they, it, it, there was no set project. So sometimes, really, the best project, the best shift or alteration in aesthetic, you know, is is born of a kind of desperation, um, as opposed to a plan or a degree or um, you know the fulfilling of uh, or the dutiful fulfilling of. Um, certain genre requirements. Yeah, so um, because you've written collections of poems and collections of essays, how do you know which is going to be the <laughs> order of the day? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You sit down at your desk, you have an inclination to write about something. Mm -hmm. uh, it, does it go onto this canvas right. of the essay or poetry? I, I'm asked that really often, and you know, the image, um, I'll, I'll just let you in on this. The image is, 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 that comes to mind is always is a, is, a, is a pinball machine. You know, like an old pinball machine where you pull the lever and the ball flies up and, and there, there are a couple of sets of little flippers. Mm -hmm. So wherever the ball goes and the flippers, the flippers need to respond in that way. Um, so it's, it's really mysterious. Um, certain, certain, I don't even know what to call them, I, ideas, images, shapes, gestures, Mm -hmm. Sentiments, uh, comports, you know, come and 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 want to be treated in a much larger context, and okay. others come 
as a kind of density mm -hmm. um, and want to be uh, treated within a certain time period, within a certain, um, with, with a certain kind of heft. So the denser, you know, hefts want to be poems and the longer, more contextual things that need to be worked out in certain mm -hmm. ways come forth as essay material. Mm -hmm. um, that said, it's a lot easier if I'm writing uh, a set of poems and I'm engaged you know, in poems to kind of cut a groove and to mm -hmm. f filter, um, again, really unconsciously, you know, certain images or ideas into that particular group because the rut is there to hold. And then, you know, there's a set of interests. Sometimes they're called concerns, which I, <laughs> not a word I love. What are your concerns as a writer? Yeah. I have, like, more concerns about dinner. Like, what are right. <laughs> dinner? What are your concerns? Really your chief concerns, concerns of about, you know, writing. I have a lot of stuff I'm interested in. Um, but concern sounds sort of pretentious. So, um, if I'm involved in a, in a set of essays, and often one essay will pick up on a uh, on a seed that's planted and you know carry it to new soil and bloom it there and carry another seed to another bit, so they're linked in a sense. Um, and sometimes those ideas call forth more essays, and so I know an idea will you know spin out in that right. way. Right. Have you um, had the experience where? you're trying out something in one genre and have to back out of it and mm. try it back in the other one? Or once you get in that groove, as you call yeah, it, you're pretty it, much it, you're it, locked it, in? It, it, it affixes pretty quickly. Okay. It, um, yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's not like an instrumental arrangement so much. You know, like, let me try this arranged for flute and oboe. Mm, no, yeah. this needs to be viola and, you know, <laughs> right. harp. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people have called your essays lyric essays. Now, is that something you're comfortable with, or is that something you kind of re resist? Sure. Or? sure. I think it is for someone else to call them that. Um, I fully <coughs> cop to you know starting life as a poet, mm -hmm. and so if there are poetic gestures or shapes or sound combinations or certain kinds of patterns unfolding that seem to be of you know, poem land and make it into prose, you know, that makes that makes sense. But I'm not setting out to write the genre or subgenre, genre, genre, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> that. That. Yeah. Called, you know, the lyric essay. Right. Um, and n never, never have. So if other people decide to call that, us that, that's, that's, fine. That, that's yeah. okay. But sure. That's not your uh, your conception of what you're. It's what not you're, really. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, is interesting and strange because I know there is a you know a form I could walk into, but mm -hmm. as soon as there's a form I can walk into, I will walk around it. Walk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like you know, that. Which yeah. is oddly, I'll tell you now. I think you're in my class. Some people, I could never do exercises, ever. I have a lot for you, but and and they work and they're lovely, but. Um, you know, as soon as anyone landed an exercise on me, some wall went down, and I just refused, couldn't, like, couldn't physically get the thing going. I just, you know, ran the other direction. Um, when, you know, we look at your collection on looking or rough likeness, um, it, it seems to me that one of the aesthetic uh, kind of thrusts of those collections is this hyper attention to observation observation sustained observation of common things uh, of familiar things of strange things uh, looking at things that maybe we're not supposed to look at uh, the man with hook for hands hooks for hands for example um, and and one thing that we'll probably be talking about in my class this semester is uh, in our kind of hyper reality world where our attention is being is competed for by this screen and that screen and and the kind of total noise of the postmodern world does that bring a larger onus on a writer like uh, of essays or poetry to pay attention and to have that kind of sustained observation and what should we be paying attention to well you know the way you phrase it makes no sense no <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know yeah no it, it, it makes complete sense and it's it's um, 
it, it sounds like you're, you're almost suggesting that um, uh, that form of attentiveness is, is antidote or, or um, uh, what's the word, tonic mm -hmm. um, to a certain kind of uh, frayed attention. Right. Um, and something that, that, that is deeply shocking to me is how, how much deflection it takes to get through a day, to get through a modern day. How much we need to not look at and how important it is it, in order to stay focused or literally stay on the road sometimes, right. you know, to not look. And so we've, you know, we've got these extraordinarily um, busy uh, worlds and these forces impinging constantly. And so we're, you know, in, in order to find a sense of um, drive or to locate uh, an internal voice, usually an internal voice, um, I mean, and by internal voice I mean the thing that is, you know, sidelong, that comes in sidelong, that is quirky, that sees differently, that responds in unconventional ways. So in order to, like, hear that, there's so much blindering going on, and it's, that's just a bizarre and unnatural way to live your life. You know, it's not not paying attention to, trying not to absorb. Right. right. So, what does that do to you know a creative capacity, a capacity that wants to absorb, that wants to see? Right. Um, so it's probably important, you know, to identify for yourselves what it is that you want to pay attention to, and what you will make, you know, part of your practice in ways that you want to engage the stuff that's irksome which I will talk about in class, engaging the irksome and the vexing. Um, but but uh, unless you can establish some kind of, you know, control and, and, and look at and frame up, like with a little tondo of little, you know, frame, um, you're overwrought, you're overrun, you know, and you often sit, you know, I imagine one can sit in front of, you know, a page or a screen and think, okay, so now what? Now, do, now what do I write about? There's so much out there. You know, so much of, I think, our job as writers is to, like, radically narrow the focus and not respond, um, but to, to, to fill the focus with what there is, you know, that you want to look at. So often, you know, that, that takes the shape of, you know, finding the strange thing to look at and really look, um, for me, right. I guess, right. is, you know what I'm saying, find, find yeah. the oddity, the sidelong thing, engage the thing that feels off or strange, um, and, uh, and live with it, you know, for right. a while, as opposed to constantly reacting, you know, to stuff that's right. impinging. It seems to me that in that kind of looking that you do, and after you render it on the page, I mean, there really is kind of a reach toward humanity there, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even if the so-called strange, mm -hmm. there's still humanity in there. And not re not reacting, but just being mm -hmm. with it. I mean, this is a tradition that goes back to Montaigne when he has an essay called "Of a Monstrous Absolutely. Child." Absolutely, I was just thinking of that one. Yeah, exactly that one. And he's sort of saying yep. the yep. same yep. thing mm -hmm. that there's humanity in in this mm -hmm. this child of the market. Um, so one of the things that students always want to know about is is process. But I am curious about your revision process. Mm -hmm. Do you work? And revise as you go along, um, because the essays that you have are have this sustained observational quality to them. Um, it, it, do you write a draft and then revise? Does it change per project, or do you revise as you go? Yeah, projects do come very differently. Mm -hmm. um, they come with their own set of needs and requirements, and you know some things happen very quickly and you know, are oddly, weirdly, unexpectedly, unbiddenly articulate, and other things are um, completely chaotic and sort of sound-oriented and need a lot of combing through. Um, I don't really think about the word revision, which feels like a task, and it feels like something, you know, I would do as a, you know, a copy editor. Mm. Um, it's a nice word, right, you know, to re-see the thing. It is. It's a nice word. You can have 
the word back. <laughs> I don't mean to yank it out and stomp on, on your word. To re-see something is a lovely thing. It really is. Um, I, I, think, I think more physically about that, that act of, of coming to find out what it is I want to say, which is really the reason I write. Um, I would like to figure out what is, what is under there, what, is, what, there what, what there is to say. And so each approach to the page um, surfaces a little bit more possibility, a little bit more of what might be there. Um, so it's kind of an act of, of discovery of archaeology, excavation, um, of, of, of trying to see a little bit more deeply. And it's, it's, it's an astonishing sensation to come back to a, a, a draft or the page that was written previously and to see something in it that I was not able to see the day before. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really mystical kind of experience. Um, a thing you thought wasn't there coming to the fore and, and speaking. And so there's a lot of listening going on, um, draft to draft, a lot of <coughs> receptivity, um, and uh, what else can I say? It, 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 I, I, I guess I think about this more as a practice than a, you know, a revising or a kind of fixing day to day. Um, and time helps, which is something you don't really have in school but I would like to promote. <laughs> you need to have things done by a certain time, <clears throat> which is both artificial and, and tremendously helpful in its artificial quality, right? Because you, it gets your ass in gear, and mm -hmm. you need to get things moving and not mm -hmm. you know, sit and hatch the thing forever. And so these external forces telling you you need it done by next Thursday are great. On the other hand, to have a thing sit, cure, um, in the, you know, smoked meat sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and kind of harden up a little bit um, it, it is, is, is its own uh, form of work. And so if you're sitting, you know, allowing a piece to sit and coming back to it in, you know, two weeks while you've got some other thing going on on the side, um, a kind of miraculous amount of work can happen. So there's, there's that to learn to work with. Time is something to learn to work with. Um, and you have, you know, you have, you have a certain relationship with that in school, and it changes radically um, when you're out of school and you're on your own and you can affix um, your own uh, sort of curing times to you know, to a piece. So sometimes, yeah. you know, holding off, like let, saying, I will not look at you for 10 days, um, creates a kind of longing and a kind of desire and an and, and eagerness to get back to. Does that sound like a lover? Maybe. <laughs> you know, I will not see you for three months. Yeah. Thus the tension builds. But there's that sense of, you know, I get to see you in nine days. I get to see you in eight days. Um, and there's work going on in that time. There's work happening in that time period. Because it's, for me, it's, it's, it's always there, right? You're always like thinking it over and mulling it over. And that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the process. That's part mm -hmm. of the work. Um, so, okay, I want to talk a little bit about um, honesty and nonfiction. And we have a kind of a couple of camps right now in the mm. contemporary scene. Mm -hmm. And we might call those the John Degada camp. Mm -hmm. And then the camp maybe Dinty Moore responded to John Degada in Brevity Magazine. Um, where, those of you not familiar, John Degada's platform goes something like this. Um, you know, f facts come second to art. Uh, he's not as much interested in capital T truth and facts as he is 
in quote, creating art. My question, is that a false choice scenario? I mean, can't it's you totally have... false choice. You can have <laughs> truthful writing that's artful, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and so when you have students um, that are new to the, to the genre, um, how do you approach that? There question? are so many artful ways to, to, honest ways to skirt the truth. Honest okay? ways to skirt the truth. So, if you would like to hold something back, right, to hold back a kind of truth, um, you, only need, you, you need only look at, you know, the god of syntax in order to be able to do that. So if you'd like to put this truth off and resist it or have a certain kind of relationship with it, right, you can start, I hope this is not too technical, you can start a kind of if-then clause and, you know, begin with an if up here and, and end up with a, you know, then X happens four pages later mm -hmm. and create an incredible sense of, of um, suspense, which, you know, will eventually get you to a truth, but could, in that interim space, introduce all kinds of, you know, forms of doubt, all kinds of... Um, you know, turning away, turn, m m gestures that turn away from, uh, or introduce other possibilities, or, you know, images that shift uh, one's perception of that truth that you land on. So there, that's just one example. There's so many interesting ways to work with the truth so that it feels illegitimate to me to sh simply shift the day of a murder from Tuesday to Wednesday because Wednesday sounds more middling in the week, right? <laughs> um, that is, as you say, I think a false, a false kind of choice. Yeah. There are ways to openly play. What if, what if this murder happened on Tuesday? What if it happened on Wednesday? What if it happened on Thursday? You know, I could imagine an essay that introduces the sensation of you know that event happening on three different days, but but real life is a kind of um, formal um, conundrum to work with, mm. you know. So there there are there are facts, and they're your set pieces that you must work around and move around, and um, that scaffolding allows for so much phenomenal creation. Um, so it's almost like, you know, sonnet forms can be, you know, wildly freeing, right? You've got your template, and you need to work with the template. But within, you know, you're not just filling in the blanks when you're writing a sonnet, right? You're, in, you're thinking about interesting ways to um, move toward and away from certain requirements. It seems to me that there's a lot of like rhetorical ways that you can handle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, for example, um, Mary Blue, know I will most of us know and hear uh, when Judy Blunt wrote Breaking Clean, the first chapter of her memoir of uh, growing up in Montana on, I believe, her father-in-law's ranch, and she wanted to be a writer. And and I may be getting this a little bit wrong, but the gist of it is that in her book. Um, there's a scene where the father-in-law comes in and smashes her typewriter with the hammer, and it's a spectacular and riveting scene, and it speaks to a lot of the themes in the book, but the fact of the matter is it never happened. Um, I think there are rhetorical ways where she could have had it yes. both ways by saying, uh, I could have imagined him at any point coming in with a hammer and mm -hmm. smashing my typewriter. That's not saying he did. That's mm -hmm. saying it's an imaginative leap. Um, is that maybe where people in Degada's camp are getting it? wrong or I, I think the possibilities for communicating fear by way of the image of a smashed typewriter or communicating the anticipation of someone's disapproval by way of imaging a smashed typewriter or laying out the smashing of a typewriter <clears throat> as a block to being truthful mm -hmm. all of those images create you know, an enormous dramatic effect, and yet he didn't smash the typewriter. Right. So you're giving up all of those possibilities if, in fact, he had to smash the typewriter. Yeah. Um, when Joanne Beard was here a number of years ago, um, <laughs> we had read um, 
out of Boys of My Youth, Cousins. And there's a character in there, uh, her cousin Wendell. Um, and my, she came to talk to my class, and, um, and they were really taken with this character, Wendell. And so one of my students asked Joanne, said, so where's Wendell now? And she said, well, Wendell doesn't exist. She's a, a, a hodgepodge of several of my cousins mm -hmm. that I smashed together into mm -hmm. this one character. So the, the composite character. Mm -hmm. um, would you do a composite character in nonfiction? <coughs> I mean, are there certain ways in which composite characters? You think of like... You know, yeah, co constitutionally, I am not capable of doing that. Yeah. It's it's a temperament. It's a sensibility. It's you know I haven't read the essay, mm -hmm. so I, I I I don't I don't know how to talk about that particular essay. Sure. But sure. but constitutionally, it is not something that releases any form of creation in me, and it and I feel resistant to it. Yeah. My sensibility is resistant to that. I guess what I tell my students is if you're going to mm -hmm. write about something somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, there's a reason to write about mm -hmm. them, and it's your job to render it as, them as mm -hmm. truthfully and as humanly and humanely as possible on the page. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I also, we talk about if you are um, the late Oliver Sacks and you have clients mm -hmm. or patients mm -hmm. that you've needed to write about, then in that case, I think composite mm -hmm. characters would be... Would be mm -hmm. That might be one instance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I think the task. I w as I was speaking, I heard you know this, this like freight train of other possibilities like roaring through, <laughs> which is usually what it's like in my head anyway. This <laughs> two minds constantly you know speaking to each other. Um, so that's the you know that's that's the freight train bringing the good news, right? Right. That, yes, right. composite characters. If you're in a position of you know, uh, medical authority where it requires mm -hmm. a kind of, you know, exploration of a phenomenon but no revelation of, you know, particular human. Yeah. Um, which can also be discussed at the beginning of a book. I have created composite characters that's according what to, that. you know, yeah. the features a disease requires, something like that. Yeah. Um, so for our, uh, the young writers in the audience, um, we were talking in my class today, uh, Philip Lopate in his Introduction to Art of the Personal Essay uh, says that uh, um, young people may make great lyric poems and, and headways in mathematics, but I don't see many young essayists making a mark on the genre. This was in 1994. Mm -hmm. He said the closest two examples were James Baldwin and Joan Didion as far as young uh, essayist. Um, is the essay uh, the, the middle age genre, or uh, do we have to wait till our retirement? Um, Phil, Philip is a middle aged writer. <laughs> in the best way. Yeah. Um, I think also he's totally revised his that particular stance. Yeah. Um, I have, I've been at conferences Philip's organized, and he's, he's thoroughly devoted to young essayists. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. So yeah. That's to my to my class, and we were talking yeah. about that. Yeah. Today. You know, there's the, and, and and of course, you know, one stance. Philip Lopate likes to inhabit a kind of curmudgeonly, you know, persona, <laughs> um, though he isn't, you know, as a human that way, um, solely at all. But um, you know, younger younger essayists, the, the the world of younger essayists is is just brilliant. There are such stars out there. There's, you know, um, Leslie Jameson's The The Empathy Exams is a spectacular book. Um, Eula and Biss. Eula Biss and Charlie D'Ambrosio. Right. Um, and Amy Leach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, it, it's just absolutely thriving and, and investigative and full of human curiosity, not, not, Middle age, not young right. curiosity. These books are, are are like investigations into sort of you know the human soul. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you have advice for these guys on sending out their manuscripts, publication, magazines? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> soul advice, you know, like. 
don't get down kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I know Anthony Doerr said that he believed in forming a relationship with editors through a series of rejections. I think that's great. I think that's really, really spectacular. And um, I've seen that happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I think uh, uh, you said that you had hit a stoppage with poetry mm -hmm. for a while and then mm -hmm. you turned to the essay mm -hmm. um, and also letting something sit for a while, mm -hmm. but not letting it sit too long. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and sitting, waiting for it to become perfect mm -hmm. because it'll mm -hmm. never become perfect. Yes. I mean, there's a, there's a... Perfect is terrible. Yeah, right? And yeah, so there's... <coughs> you need to submit your work. Yeah. You need to develop some thick skin. Yeah. It's okay to get the rejection. Keep, mm -hmm. keep, keep, keep at it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, are there particular journals that are doing interesting things with nonfiction? That okay, that's a good question. And, and it's my first good question. No, 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 no. <laughs> so where I was going, where, where I was going, that's a good question. But I'll answer the other one. <laughs> and the other one. It's about sending something out and, 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 okay, so how to interact with um, an, an essay or poem or whatever thing you send out that is then sent back. So there are a lot of things you can do when that thing is sent back. You know, you can feel sort of degraded um, or despondent or energized. I'll just, you know, pack this thing up and send it right back out um, if you're that sort. Hail type and um, so you can have this you know range of responses another response is is to um, send the thing out and just be so freaking glad it's off your desk right forget about it right. like send it out and then when it comes back open it up you know if you're lucky someone has said you know something more than sorry this isn't right for us mm -hmm. um, and may have said something like you know, this is this is terrific. I don't feel like you found the ending yet. You know, and uh, oh, whatever they say, open it up and look at it. You know, as if you'd n you've never seen this thing before. And very often, you know, you'll have some whirlwind kind of response, like, oh, third paragraph, pff, out. You know, mm -hmm. you'll excise this thing, and it, it it because it comes back after having traveled in the world. It comes back, and it smells different, and it's got you know the scent of like French cigarettes on it. It's, it's a different <laughs> thing. And it comes to you and you see it and it works, you know, revision works very quickly then. And you can, you know, just right. see it, it. It's this weird kind of clarification. Like, oh, you want to do this. I can do that now. Um, the relationship via, re, you know, rejection is fantastic. I've seen with a number of students um, uh, exactly that happen. They will get a rejection um, with some note written on it, and they'll write, you know, send another essay, and have a bit of um, actual reason to correspond mm -hmm. then with the editor, you know. Thank you know, thanks for your rejection. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you say to yeah. people who stomp you, yeah. um, you know, whatever essay didn't work for you, but I'm sending this other one, you know, that shares some features but is different in this way or whatever you, you know whatever you'd like to say human to human um, and there's you know a kind of entry point and then they'll reject it again and you can you know, wait a minute and say you know send something else but but there's communication going and 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 very often I think editors um, are deeply happy to be in actual human communication with people and not yeah. simply you know reading please you know read this enclosed essay yeah kind of um, thing. In graduate school, I think it was my friend Jeff here that said this. He said, uh, you know, we always said a, a, a handwritten rejection is enough to go to dinner on. For, to sell, to sell. <laughs> That's the kind of world we're in. But, but it is that, it's that somebody took time to say, you know, listen, this is not quite there, mm -hmm. but, you know, try us again. Well, also on your end, I think the response can be something like, okay, now we're in it. Now I'm in it. Yeah. Great. This is, a, I'm, in, I'm working. We're all working. This is working. Yeah. I'm, I'm just... In, this is all in process. Yeah. Um, who are you reading right now? Um, I am. Let me. Oh, I'm reading Tanahasi Coates' mm -hmm. um, new collection. I have uh, some CD Wright that I wanted to read again right now. I 
just ordered her new collection of essays. Mm -hmm. I'm reading Sean Kane's The Wisdom of Myth Tellers. Soon I'll be reading a lot of student stuff because <laughs> school starts on Monday. Um, and wow, there's. I'm reading Jane Benson's. She's a political philosopher and she has a, a collection of essays called Vibrant Matter. And I'm reading that. I just finished Morris Berman's The Reenchantment of the World, which is a history, a uh, kind of history and philosophy of science thing. Because I was using the word Cartesian and I realized, what are you talking about? <laughs> you haven't like read Descartes for a very long time. <laughs> so stop using that word so cavalierly until you get your hands back in it. Um, along those lines, um, is there a go-to essay for you in teaching, like, or or a couple of essays like that that you feel are highly teachable, and, and what makes those or that oh, essay? Yeah. Okay. So Joanne Beard's Fourth State of Matter, I think, is a brilliant, brilliant essay um, for so many reasons. The way in which she is present in that piece. There's very little between. Uh, I think, I have a sense, it, it's, it, there's, there's a sheer quality between um, the actual human sitting to write it and the voice that emerges on the page. Right. And she works with time so brilliantly in that piece. A student of mine just said, he was so shocked by that essay that he said he felt assaulted. And, and was just coming to understand the, the power of you know, the essay, right. and was not angry that he was assaulted. He was shocked to have been so assaulted and moved and yanked by an essay. Um, um, let me see, other essays. That, that you know, produced a, a particularly powerful. Sure. Also, I have to say, well, Leslie Jameson's whole new, you know, collection I think is, is fantastic. I haven't, you know, taught taught those yet. Essays that um, really want to understand why they're being written. So so an an essay in which an author enters not knowing the answer, not 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 even really knowing the story um, that they're writing about, um, entering with a question, entering with a sense of exploration. A sense of shock at their own reaction. So I'm thinking of actually Charlie D'Ambrosio's essay on Mary Kay Letourneau. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I can't remember the title. It might just be something that simple. Do, do you remember Mary Kay Letourneau? Mm -hmm. The teacher mm -hmm. who took up with her 13-year-old student and went to jail and then got out of jail and married. They married. So he's really trying to figure this thing out. So any time, you know, a, writer comes to something that she is really trying to figure out. Like, this thing stands before me and I don't get it. That's exciting. Right. You know, that makes for really exciting work. And I think a lot of times, you know, people approach essays because they want to write this thing that they've, you know, that's, that's nagging them. Like you've got I, a story yeah. and you want to tell it. Interesting writing happens, okay, when you face that thing in that story that you don't get. Right, so it's a kind of shift from feeling like I have this thing I want to get it down to I have this thing I don't know what to do with mm -hmm. and I don't even understand and that you know rankles those little those things those feelings that are really complicated repulsion for example you know um, the things that 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 repel you uh, the things that you know are repellent to others but not to you uh, the sort of back of the head. Um, thought that has always dogged you. Mary Gordon has a beautiful section in her uh, collection of essays, uh, Seeing Through Places. Um, it's a section on play and playing as a child, and the first line is something like, I was a failure at being a child. And there's something you know she's carried for a long time and has said and is trying to figure out. 
Well, I mean, the essay is the space mm -hmm. um, where we see a mind at work on exactly. the page, trying to work through yeah. this to make the attempt, yeah. right, to yeah. understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And I like that example that you gave, because there, there are those essays that you read where it's like, yeah, this writer has been packing around this set mm -hmm. of... Mm -hmm. Not concerns, not concerns, <laughs> but but questions. Mm -hmm. Or um, why am I obsessed with this, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? About not it? well. I know exactly why I'm obsessed with this, and I will put it down on the page. Right, right. You might know some of it, yeah, right? and and have a, you know a couple of clues about what's going on. But yeah, you know, writing it out until you 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 hit the place where you can't figure it out, yeah. and then working with that. Is well, what really produces something interesting, I think. Well, that has something to do with discovery, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I start a piece and I, and, I, and I inevitably start a piece, I don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. If I outlined it, if I front to back, mm -hmm. why the hell write it? Because I already know what the outline is. Half the uh, joy for me mm -hmm. uh, is seeing where it's mm -hmm. going to go. And I should say also that, and, and I think we don't talk about this nearly enough, poets do. Um, but the, a, a lot of that discovery ought to be happening in language, you know, in, right. in the shapes of sentences, in the way sound kickstarts new sounds, which hold meaning. Absolutely. So, you know, a series of sounds can get you closer, and listening to those sounds can get you closer to your truth than, you know, what you've ran through with your therapist last week. And, you know, <laughs> but in order to train toward sound and train toward shapes of sentences and syntaxes, you need to read for those issues. You need to read poetry. You need to read long, long, you know, clausal things hooked together. You need to read short, you know, dense things um, and, and, and pay attention to the shapes that you see and hear on the page in prose um, and and enter into idea and discovery by way of sound and shape and not simply by way of like you know tearing your self open and you know ruminating and psychologizing right. and those are all completely you know wonderful ways of getting closer to truths but there are deeper truths to to hook into by way of more somatic, oral, even visual approaches. Well, see, that's where the art comes in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's caring about language, mm -hmm. right? It's giving a damn about your sentences. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I feel mm -hmm. like as a prose writer, anytime my sentences start to run flat or I feel like I'm getting lazy, I stop and I read poetry. Um, and then that, that heightened focus yeah. on the mm -hmm. word brings me back in. Mm -hmm. I often tell mm -hmm. my students that in, in the essay, uh, how you say something is often as important or even more important than mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're saying because it has to do with the, the, the music mm -hmm. of the language um, and why that word mm -hmm. and not another word mm -hmm. um, and literally paying attention at, at that kind of high level. Mm -hmm. um, final question, what are you working on now? Well, I have a set of essays going so I'm working on that, and um, or or I'm you know working on listening into the next kind of essay, and I am trying to find my way back into poems, which is always mm -hmm. you know trying to find your way back into writing at all after a book is is really is anxious. It's very it kind of makes you writhe around in your seat a lot. So I'm doing a lot of writhing around in my seat. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. I'm never happier than having, you know, just being in it and, you mm -hmm. know, head, head in work that's moving and ongoing and kind of suggesting the next thing, but, you know, trying to puncture through that particular sky is, is yeah, so there's a lot of writhing going on. That's good. <laughs> yeah. no, that's great. I can't wait to see the new collection. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, by the way. I appreciate it. Um, questions from the audience? Or comments. You don't or have comments. to ask me anything. <laughs> if you just want to say something. Yeah. Here. I had one uh, sort of related to what you were discussing with uh, submissions and rejections and so <laughs> forth. Um, and 
as as a poet, I, I feel like prose writers might get a little more help. I mean, I mean, generally speaking, poets don't have editors. Uh, I think that when the scale and scope or form of a project supersedes the page or multiple pages, then you do get things like, hey, this is pretty interesting, but not now. Mm -hmm. um, or, or maybe send me something else. Uh, I, I feel like, am I, am I just supposed to accept that like, all of these could be squibs or like, because I, I feel like because the project is bigger, like, and the investment is bigger or something, like, the, the, because poems are concentrated, that they're more disposable or something. I don't, I'm, I'm, oh, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding, poems. like, what, you know, can someone help me? <laughs> <laughs> idea there for a second. Um, Do you see what I'm getting at though? No, not really. Um, <laughs> I, I just say like, a little more. Like 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 a like a longer prose piece yeah. is going is going to to get a more careful response oh. or more likely to get a more careful response than not these, which is what you send five poems out and you get not these back, but mm. you send out, you know, a thirty page essay and they're gonna have something to say if they care at all about it. Um, and in which case, with the poem, they just say yes, or they say not these, and mm -hmm. I feel like... You know, yeah, I had, a, I, had a, I had a couple things to say to that. I mean, I can be wrong, I usually am. <laughs> so, I've heard from a number of mm, fiction friends of mine that they have been getting, I mean, amazing writers have been getting pieces back, or entire manuscripts back, saying, you know, this is a stunning book, but it's too quiet. And I've, I've heard this from a few people, and I, re I remember a like, late night you know, wine bar talk, and they were like, what is quiet? What do they mean? It's too quiet. What is it not, what is, what is that criteria? Quiet. You know, and of course, having every glorious thing that like Marilyn Robinson wrote out there, that's quiet, isn't it? So what the heck's going on? Then, the other thought was, and I will get to some, I, I'm making a thought here, don't worry. I had, a, I had a teacher in college who would write on our poems, yes or no. And he had really big handwriting, so he'd write yes, and it was excited, and he'd underline it, and then he'd write no. <laughs> and then we'd go off, you know, to the bar and think, oh, what, did, what did Stuart mean? And we'd have to part, it, it was so good. It was so helpful. And it was so annoying, and we loved him, and we hated him, and it was everything. But to get this thing, yes, what did he love in this poem? And 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 then we think, well, maybe he loved this, and maybe it was that. And so, you know, we, we had no idea what he liked about it. And then the no's, we'd think about in exactly the same way. What, what the hell didn't he like? This was a good poem. Why didn't he like it? Mm. So we'd have to parse through and go through this all, you know, on our own. Um, I don't think, per genre, the responses are any different. Um, I I don't I don't know if perhaps what you're talking about is the fact that it's easier to hook into um, a narrative, a chronology, than a poem, and editors can m quickly say, you know, this is a truly interesting story, but it goes on too long, and so cut it, and you know, we'll think about it as opposed to a poem, which often, unless you're writing, you know, straight up narrative poem, isn't fulfilling that form. And so the critique on it is more complicated, and so you get, like, not right, not right, back. You know, that may be something you're sensing. That there's, that it's easier to talk about certain forms than it is to talk about other forms. Okay, other questions or comments? Um, I was just curious about kind of what initially drew you to poetry in the first place. I mean, you could have gone a ton of different routes, mm -hmm. but to say kind of poetry sounds like it kind of called out to mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I loved being called out to by language. That's exactly it. Um, you know, I, I was, I, 
kid who kept, a, you know, little notebooks and copied out poems, and I loved everything about the sound and the shape of language made to leap in that way. And I remember also being very young and reading Dickinson and thinking, I have no idea what she's saying, but I love this. Yeah. I love this. And it was like hearing a prayer and not understanding, almost in another language, yeah. and not understanding the words, but understanding holiness because of the cadence, you know, or understanding speech apart from normal daily speech because of the cadence, yeah. so or the breath, and that those those features I think were really important to me as you know, yet early on. Thank you. Any other back there? I had one other. Um, I was really. I was really struck by what you said. I'm going to stand up and say Nancy too. Um, I was really struck by what you said about time and just like waiting with pieces and um, and not being able to do that now, but hoping to do that one day. And I was wondering too, do you feel a certain amount of pressure to like write a certain amount each year or to like produce a certain amount of pieces? Mm -hmm. And how do you grapple with that? You know, it's not so much pressure as it is a, a kind of antsy, peeled away from myself feeling if I'm not writing. Um, and, and so, you know, if I'm in a situation, you know, a life situation uh, where I can't write for a while, I, I get, uh, you know, very anxious and, and um, agitated and I feel like I'm not able to, you know, think in, or feel or see um, in, in, in ways that, that are, are primal to me. Um, so it's it's less a sense of like I need to get work done, but it was early on for sure. You know, I was very disciplined um, and sat down to it um, because that was my work. Right? And so, not not being able to create work, you know, in that sense was was anxious for slightly different reasons. You know, at the beginning of this practice. And then there was one in here. Yeah, Courtney. Oh, I just had a question about the essay, Shit's Beautiful. <coughs> and I was wondering if you, um, what inspired that essay, and if you felt like a little risky with it, or just what your feelings oh, yeah. were. I, I, this is an essay about shit, sort of. It's about some other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I, you know, I thought, I couldn't write that essay. I just thought, what do you, you know, how, how will I do this? A lot. And I like that feeling. You know, it wasn't so much fear as, as, as just sort of honest, like, open eyed, like, how are you going to do this? You know, you can't do this. Yeah, you can do this. Um, so I, I had no idea how to do it. And that was great. That was exciting. Um, and I, it was one of those, you know, essays that uh, I had thought about uh, for a very long time, um, and and thought uh, I I would like to find the language for for speaking this. Um, so but on, on it, it was a very alive essay. It was very alive in that sense of constantly um, asserting that, like, you know, I don't know, I don't know if you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> Right? But that's what you want, you know. You want that kind of, you know, prickly sort of. Mm, I don't think you're up to this. You're not really up to this. I have no idea. This could so much fail. <laughs> right? So if you're not, if your face is not like right in that, like you could so much fail, mm -hmm. and then you go kind of on in spite of it. Mm -hmm. You really will. I, 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 I like that. That's great. So. Anything yet? All right, thanks so much. Thank you.